going to remind you that our goal today is to get more comfortable identifying fruit tree pests and beneficials so that we can research them further using, using our chosen IPM resource that you guys learned in Integrated Pest Management for Fruit Trees in the class. So here we are identifying so that you guys can then go further and deeper to find out what to do. Now that you know what pest you have, what do you do about it? We'll talk about some solutions today, but I want to empower you so that you can always uh, find out what to do once you know what pest you have. Here's a picture. What is going on in this picture? What's wrong with this picture, with this fruit tree? So now Susan is answering our quiz. Susan says from Nova Scotia, she says nasty rotten aphids are eating the leaves <laughs> and causing problems. That's amazing. What do you say, Stacy? did you get this one right? I think she sure did. What about the description about nasty and rotten? Is that harsh? Is, she, is Susan being too harsh? Aphids are pretty amazing, but then again, I'm a little biased. Um, they are incredible pests. They have this reproductive uh, capacity that's unknown on any other pest that I've ever seen. They make 300 of themselves every day. So they can be rotten and nasty, but they are pretty amazing if you think about it. They can reproduce. They can make 300 babies a day. A day? Yeah. Oh my gosh. A day. That's a lot of babies. The females give, yeah, the females give live birth. So basically they just reproduce produce themselves. Um, and if you have gravid female, females, one a day, you get 300 every day. Oh my gosh, that's a lot of babies. Okay, so here, this was Roger's picture. And Roger, I think you might be with us right now. Um, so this Roger said he had noticed the following on the underside of the following of the some of the leaves of my Stanley plum. His solution was he sprayed it with seven about 10 days ago. For the future, uh, what is it? Well, we know it's aphids or otherwise known as nasty, rotten aphids. <laughs> Thank you, Susan. <laughs> the other Susan. Um, and what is it that what advice can you give me? So do you want to give a few words of advice, Stacey, or uh, should, should? Yeah. Uh, yeah, go ahead. It's a, you know, I mean, Using a pesticide, absolutely, you can use that for aphids. Um, there's also a couple things. If you have a very small localized colony of aphids, you can actually spray it just with water. Aphids have this beak that they use to feed from, and when you spray them with water, it actually breaks their beaks and stops them from feeding. So mm. really effective to do in a small localized area. There's also a whole host of beneficial insects that you can use on aphids. Ladybugs is the first one that kind of comes to mind in my idea, um, that you have common ladybugs, the ones you find in your back backyard would definitely eat aphids. There's also this really incredible midge called Aphid Aphides aphomyza. Amazing little midge. They're native to all of Canada um, and it lays its egg in the aphid colony and it will come back year after year in someone's yard. So it's got some real long-term benefits. It's thank you so much for mentioning beneficials because that is a lot of what the students have been learning in the course. There's a whole section on biological and how to attract these beneficial insects to your garden naturally. Um, and I think in the long term, that's what we all need to be doing, farmscaping, figuring out what plants we can get. Um, one year we had a huge aphid infestation in our cherry trees in our orchard, and I was freaked out about it. I came back a couple of days later and it was covered with ladybugs and they were having so <laughs> much fun. They feasted away and in literally less than a week, the trees looked perfect again. So they're so powerful. Now, in Stacy, in what cases do people actually buy in, um, you know, beneficials like ladybugs? I know you guys sell them at Natural Insect Control. So when would people turn to buying in beneficials? Ideally, when you're starting to see the pest population just building up. So at the very beginning of it, before it's had a chance to really build up in, in your plants, is the ideal time to put it in. It's much easier to deal with a smaller pest population with a beneficial than like a gigantic or huge pest population. It takes a long time for that beneficial insect to eat its way through those. Absolutely. Okay, so in the longer term, we're all going to have a very biodiverse garden or orchard so that we can naturally bring them in, but buying them in is also an option. So Roger also said, so Roger is the one with the aphid problem, and he says the fruit on his plum tree is also coloring early and looks deformed. And if we go mm. to our Omafra resource and 
I'm in Ontario. I use OMAFRA. You guys are from all over. You've got resources in Texas that you found through the course. So you'll look to your own resource. But again, we found that here in this damage section, it does say that flowers and fruitlets may not develop. They may drop. They uh, ne nectarine fruit may be deformed. So I'm wondering if perhaps the plums are deformed and coloring early because of the aphids. What do you think, Stacy? Do you think that's a possibility? Absolutely. Aphids have this piercing beak that they use to pierce um, leaves, but they also can pierce fruit. So it doesn't surprise me that he's getting some deformity in the fruit that's trying to form. Great. Yeah. So that, that's exactly the problem. And again, once we go to our resource, as I did here with Omafra, there are some amazing suggestions. So for aphids, you should be using your dormant oil early in the spring. And we learned about that in the course. Natural enemies, which is the, bio, the beneficial insects we've been talking about. And if necessary, there are insecticides. And then there's Stacy's amazing idea of water, just spraying them with water crazy, huh? That water would really interrupt the way they function. Might wash them yeah. off as well, wash them off the leaf. So and every time you wash one off, it burns its energy. So over time, it's going to probably die just out of frustration of being <laughs> washed off the plant constantly. <laughs> well, they die of frustration. There you go. Okay. <laughs> so now next little quiz here, folks, and I'll look at the chat in a minute. What is this past? Susan from Nova Scotia is the one who said that this is an apple maggot that you're looking at, the pest ID. If we could, should we all be saying bravo? Did you get it right? <laughs> you are totally right. It is. It's those beautiful black and white wings are that very distinctive on those apple maggots. Interesting. Okay, so the black and white wings, because I look at it, you know what's funny? I see a moose head. I am Canadian, but I, I see that the shape of them seems kind of different than other flies. Um, I don't know. I just looked at the two little curvy things at the top. I thought, I think that's an apple maggot. But uh, okay, so the black and white wings. Now let's mm -hmm. go from there. Let's see what's coming up next. Okay, again, pest identification. What could this be? And I think, Susan, if you jumped in again, you may uh, guess again. So what is this, Stacy? Again, brown tunnels through your apples, apple maggot larvae are causing that. This was interesting because the apple actually, some of the apples stayed whole, like, you know, grew uh, anyways, but the, this apple shriveled up and it's quite small. Mm -hmm. So I wonder why the apple maggot would have this effect that some of the baby apples will shrivel and some will continue to grow, but still look awful. It's difficult to say, to be perfectly honest with you, why some grow and some don't. It may be just uh, like anything, some apples are stronger and may be able to grow with the pest while other some apples cannot. Yeah, and it could be that the, this was in a cluster of apples and this was the small one, the little runt of the litter there and that it just couldn't handle it. Okay, mm -hmm. so apple maggot is our theme at the moment. Let's go to the next slide. I got this from Brian. Okay, so tell us what we see here. When I look at that photo, to me, it looks like some kind of uh, insect damage. And I'm thinking maybe plum curcurio, but I'm not 100% mm -hmm. sure on that one. But definitely something as that, that fruit is forming has gotten to it. Could it be apple maggot as well? Because there's little little bits of dimples. Could that be? It, that is, that's a really good idea also as to what it could be. Yeah, so I think what I do in these situations, cut them open sometimes, see what's inside. Now, I think he's got another picture over here. Same apple, same, you know, insect damage. But again, mm -hmm. I guess we'll have to, I don't see any half moon crescents or anything that might give us more of a hint. So I think for Brian, he has to cut it open, show us a little bit more and see what kind of, would yeah, you get the tunneling, you know? Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So let's keep going. How are you doing, everybody? Tell us in the chat box. So Donald asks, what is this? Um... No, it is a little bit, yeah, it's, what, what did you think when you saw this, Stacey? 
again, again, it has that crescent moon damage, which leads me to the plum curcurio. I feel like um, it looks like some sort of scab also. I'm kind of on the fence on this one. Yeah, and so I'm going to turn the whiteboard on. Whoa, it's very hard to draw straight, but that was the the half moon crescent thingy. Mm -hmm. um, but it is, yeah, not, usually they're not that big. So again, Donald, it'd be great to cut that open, show us what's inside. And it's such a good little detective move to see what, what more you can find. Okay, I'm going to look at the chat box, but I would love you guys... Uh, somebody sent this in. Tell us, what might this be? Um, go back in the meantime. I'm going to go back to the slideshow. Okay. Well, they weren't fast enough. Stacy, what is this? That is gypsy moth larva. It is a very bad pest this season. Um, I can't believe how many people are having trouble with gypsy moth this year. It seems to be um, the pest of the year, unfortunately. Gypsy moth has about a seven-year cycle, so it kind of ramps up to getting to the point where we're getting right now, and then it's going to seem to go, uh, go away, and the next year is going to be a little bit less, and then it sort of go declines and then only to ramp up again about seven years from now. But it is the pest of the summer. It's been really tough. Yeah, you see a lot of emails about it. Um, how did you know, just from looking at this picture, um, what was the uh, what were the identifying features? A gypsy moth caterpillar have these blue dots, which this picture doesn't show really well, followed by these reddy orange dots, and that's what I usually look at. Yeah, and they're kind of furry. <laughs> what is that fur? Yes. What is that? Is it useful for these caterpillars? It's it is absolutely useful. It helps uh, keep birds away from them because when you're furry, oh. birds don't want to eat you. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You wouldn't want to get, you know, fur stuck in your teeth or beak <laughs> or whatever. Okay. So now Donald asks, what is this? We have just answered. Now this is also from Donald. Uh, he writes, first one of the sticky boards to assess apple maggot moth but seems to be lots of other stuff on there. So Stacy, this is something we're all going through. We put up our yellow sticky traps with a open heart. Well, I guess we are murdering insects, but we're like, please inform us on what we have in our orchard. And then we look at this and it's like, okay, what is this? What are we looking at? How do we know? What do you do when you're looking at a yellow uh, sticky trap? What I would do is I'd actually break it down into smaller sections. So I would take one of the grids and potentially cut it out of the trap and just look at that small section, picking out what things are moths, what things are flies, which things are beetles, and sort of separating them out and then starting to identify in those bigger families. That's sort of the easiest way that I have found to do it when you have this much going on in a sticky card. That's really overwhelming if you're trying to do the whole thing all at once. Oh, interesting. Okay, so let's say you zoom in on a square, just for example. So I'm going to choose this square. Whoa. Sorry, guys, pretty weird. So that square. Now, once you zoom in and you're identifying, so maybe you can tell what's a fly. Um, but then how do you take it further? All you have is a little smudgy guy with some legs. And how do you how do you take your next steps? Yeah, you're really hoping that in the sample that's atta attached to the sticky card, that it has enough distinguishing characteristics. So with flies, we want to make sure that it has some wings. We can see the veins in the wings of the fly. For moths, we want to make sure that they have their wings. Also, their antenna are very distinct. And with beetles, we want to make sure that they have their antenna. And then also any markings that might be on the backs of them may be a distinguishing characteristic. It is not easy to take a look at cards and be able to identify, especially when you don't have them physically in front of you. Um, identifying from a photo sometimes can be really difficult. So having the card in front of you may be your biggest benefit to be able to figure out what's on there. So Donald is looking for apple maggot moths. Now we've got some big stuff here. I don't know. That looks like a moth to me. Um, from and again, it's hard to identify from a picture. Do you think he has any apple maggot moths in this? 
when I looked through this, I wasn't seeing anything. That large moth potentially could be a male gypsy moth. Um, it also could be a diamondback moth. Um, it could be a few other ones that are pretty common at this time of the year. Um, but it was really difficult for me to even see if I saw any apple maggots in there. Again, I'm looking for those wings that have that sort of black and white to them. But I was having a hard time being able to see anything in there. Gotcha. And this interesting black and white thing uh, at the bottom, what is that? Or what might that be? That honestly looks like some kind of uh, butterfly or moth. Yeah. Um, it looks like it's just part of the wings and that's about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, poor thing. Oh my gosh. Okay, great. Thank you for talking us through that. And now, so this is what I wanted to ask is the steps of how to identify your trap. So we've gone through that. Now, guys, I want everybody to participate. We've got, you know, a good few people on the webinar. Who is this guy? And I'm going to check to see if there's anything new in the chat box. I must say, this creature is beautiful. Look at those colors. <laughs> wow. Do you get a lot of that within the insect world, these beautiful colors? Absolutely. Very common. Those colors in that particular insect are warning colors. So it's giving warning to any other predator that might think it's a good snack that it may not be the best snack to eat because it has those very distinct red and orange warning colors saying that, hey, I'm not that great to eat. Ah, interesting. Okay. So we got a suggestion from Grant, clown wasp. That was his suggestion. Donald says, oh, thank you, Donald. Donald says, I can see fine. Can someone provide more context for where found or near where, where the, I guess where people are finding these insects? Okay, shall we find out? Is it, as Grant says, a clown wasp? And let's all keep in mind uh, Donald's comment. It's good to know where people are seeing this stuff. In the last webinar, I, I mentioned where people were from and in this one, I did not. Rolf says he got this picture in the garden path. Um, and <laughs> Rolf, if you remind us where, I think you're in Ontario. I'm pretty sure Rolf is in Ontario. So this one is in the garden path. Rolf, amazing picture. Let's find out more about it. Susan says, I think it's a wasp of some kind. So clown wasp or another kind of wasp. Let's find out. Okay, so when Rolf wrote me, he said, I think this is a great golden digger wasp. And look at that. Stacy, is he right? And if so, what is this wasp doing here? I totally think he is right. That wasp is getting a delicious treat, which looks like it is a grasshopper. Um, so wasps are pretty predatory in that sense that they do feed on other insects so it's actually a good thing to have in your backyard uh, but that looks like he's getting a nice meal out of that grasshopper wow you'd think the grasshopper has kind of got a sort of like a bit of an armor like is it easy to get the meat out <laughs> i don't know how does the wasp go in there and have you know snack time with that Keep in mind, they do have pretty powerful mandibles, so they can munch through the outside of the insect, which is usually filled with chitin, which is very hard. They can munch through that to get to the, the good bits of that, that grasshopper. Rolf, I got to commend you on these pictures. They are amazing. Okay, so this is what he actually wrote. He wrote, the great golden digger wasp is apparently the hardest worker in the garden. Harmless, <laughs> unless you happen to step on them barefoot, in which case they might sting. But otherwise, they just aerate the ground and eat lots of big bugs that otherwise do a lot of, oh, our pictures are in the way, do a lot of, how do I get rid of us? Not exactly sure. Okay. Oh, let's see if this happens. Uh, a lot of bugs that otherwise do a lot of garden damage, uh, got lots of them in the garden. It's amazing what they can do. Oh. Okay, I'm back. That is fantastic. Okay, let's keep going. Where are we going from here? Also a picture from Rolf. I love this picture too. Look at the character of this guy. Look at his little face. Rolf writes, so that lovely beetle we found by your grapes, it's called a grapevine beetle. It's not considered uh, a crop pest because it leaves the fruit alone, but it does eat the leaves. Um, now I'm gonna disappear myself so I can read this. Got this beetle the last three years, picked them and drowned them in the in oil. In oil. Uh, now the wasp is killing them for me. So 
you know what? Poor little guy. He looks pretty cute, but I wouldn't want him eating the leaves of my crops either. So you got to be brutal. All right, let's go on to the next slide. So we got a bunch of questions about Japanese beetles. Jerry writes, I would really like to ask Stacy about Japanese beetles. They are still driving me crazy to the point of being in tears last night. They annihilate one plant species after the other. And I was away yesterday, so they started on my hollyhocks and completely denuded them in a day's time. I'm just interested in any additional information that Stacy might have. The surround, she uses the surround spray, seems to be working to some degree on my fruit trees, but not well enough. And at the same time, I got another email from Roger. Roger writes, every year I do battle with Japanese beetle, but until now I have removed them by hand. As the trees get bigger and more trees are added, I need to do something different. You know, he can't pick them off the big trees. So everybody has questions about Japanese beetles for you. What do you have to say about that, Stacy? I'm sorry, it's a terrible pest. Japanese beetles feed on 300 different kinds of plants. So the comments that they were feeding on hollyhocks and then moving to another plant and feeding on that is very common. They just have a wide host range. I'm a big supporter of actually using the Japanese beetle traps and I realize that some people are really don't believe in them but they're a really unique trap. This is one of the few traps where there is both a bait to trap the girls and a lure to trap the boys. So we have a bait in there that smells like flowers so the girls comes to the trap. We have a bait and uh, lure in there that smells like girls so the boys come to the trap. When you use a Japanese beetle trap you are trapping both sexes which means you have less Japanese beetles laying eggs in your area. You're just getting less of the population all over. Most people feel like when we put a trap up, it draws 400 beetles from the surrounding area. There actually literally may be just 400 beetles in your yard. It's a big misconception with it. So I think the traps, especially when you have this much beetle pressure, is really important because they will defoliate almost anything. So according to you and your perspective, is it okay to put the trap right in your fruit tree? I mean, people often say, sure, get a Japanese beetle trap and put it in your neighbor's yard to draw them away from your tree. Very valid point. That is really a great idea. We want to draw them away from the area. I've seen a lot of people, instead of hanging them in the tree, they hang them on shepherd's hooks, which means that they can move it around the yard, away drawing, again, the beetles away from where they don't want them to feed. I think having that versatility of being able to move it around can really make the trap even more effective. So I'm going to ask Jerry and Roger and any of you guys who try this, take pictures of how you're doing it and send them to me and tell me how it's going. If you've already got a Japanese beetle problem and everything you're trying is not working, try this and tell me how it goes because I can you know, take your pictures and use them in further education and together we'll figure out an answer to this. Um, Grant, uh, oh, Grant solved, Susan's problem is solved. Thanks, Grant. Anthony writes, is it advised to place Japanese beetle traps on the perimeters of the orchard? Or do you have to put them inside the orchard? I would say perimeters is actually a really good idea. Again, the idea of drawing the pests out of the orchard and into the trap. The trap should be more attractive than any of the plants that you're growing inside. Okay, and if you have like woodland on one side or something like that, do you want to draw them towards the woodland? Well, they're going to die anyways, I guess, trying to give them an alternate place to go hang out. Does it really matter? Potentially, if you, yeah, if you can do that, that's fantastic. You know what I mean? Uh, but you really, really want to try to draw them out of the orchard, draw them out of the trees that you don't want them in. Okay, great. I'm excited to hear, Jerry, I hope you try this, or Roger, and I really want to be kept uh, informed on how it goes with lots of pictures. So this is me. This is Susan P. Poisoner. Um, and uh, this I took a picture of this cutie as he was uh, climbing up my espalier apple tree. Uh, Stacey, you told me this is a banded grasshopper. Can you tell me a little bit about these guys? Am I, should I, this was last year, but should I expect that he would be damaging my tree or the leaves or what would he be doing? 
he definitely is a damager. He mm. has beautiful munching mouth parts, and he is going to cause a lot of problems. He's probably going to feed on all sorts of plants inside your orchard. So, yes, this is not a great guy to have. Uh, the good news is that if you have a big bird population, these are a giant snack for a lot of birds. You know, I knock on wood, uh, we have birdhouses and I really promote birdhouses in orchards, uh, certain types to, to get Eastern black, um, sorry, Eastern bluebirds and tree swallows. So we have mm. our, uh, we have tenants in our birdhouse this year, pretty much every year. I have had no problems with caterpillars this year. I haven't seen these guys this year, anything. These sweet little birds are fantastic. However, at the same time, I had um, beautiful caterpillars for, uh, what are they called? Uh, swallowtail butterflies. Um, okay. And they were so cute. We named them Harry and Megan. They were sweet. They were hanging off the dill plants. They were gorgeous. So we were like coping. Everything would be okay. And then Harry and Megan disappeared. So these mm. beautiful caterpillars. And, but you know, I don't think it's our tenants in, in our birdhouse. I think it was a robin because she was looking really guilty and she had this big tummy like she had eaten something yummy. So I think I, I prefer <laughs> to blame the robin. But I guess that's the downside. The good side of having, you know, a birdhouse is that it would eat insect pests. Uh, the bad mm -hmm. side is it might eat beneficials too. Yeah, exactly. Hmm. Poor Harry and Megan. Oh, well, never mind. Okay, so let's move on. This is from Rolf. I like this, Rolf. Thank you for sending this. Uh, he says, I thought to get some pictures of my traps from the apple tree. They seem to work. So again, we're looking and like when you look at that, does anything jump out at you as maybe being an apple maggot or is this just passersby that happened to get stuck? I think we have a few wasps stuck on there. Uh, the the insect that is on the right top with his legs hanging up, that potentially could be an apple mega. It would be great if I could see his little wings. Um, that would probably help out a little bit, but that's potentially it. It's great to see that um, the apple mega traps are working. Um, but yeah, that's sort of what I see when I look at this one. Okay, so interesting. I hope I circled the right guy. Um, I think that's the one with the legs in the air. So that's interesting. So they're pretty big um, in their fly form, uh, these apple maggots, because that's a pretty big, that's that's a big one. They're big, mm -hmm. not little guys. Okay, next picture is the same one. That's a bit more of a close up. Here you see a wing of the one on the left. Um, I don't think either of these is the guy with the legs in the air. Any Any more information from this view or not really? Again, those two those two insects to me just look like two common flies right. um, and not necessarily an apple maggot fly. Okay. Okay. Now, question I wanted to talk to you about is this. I had just put up my, um, my own spherical ball trap for apple maggots. And what you can see up above the white thing with a, it's a liquid inside a bubble is the lure. It's a... Um, apple maggot attractant. I think it smells like ripe apples to the insects, to that particular insect. Now I took this out, it, I took it out of the, the, the little um, metal, what's it called? The little preservative container. I cut it out, took this out and I thought, oh, am I supposed to make a hole in this so that the insects can actually smell the lure? It's, it's bubbled into plastic. So how does this work, Stacy? The, the, those lures actually the plastic is permeable so over time the lure emits slowly out of it that gives you a longer uh, time that the lure is going to work with the apple maggot trap so no need to pierce it it just uh, slowly evaporates within that uh, releasing the scent to attract the pest to the trap interesting okay and so yeah so and i wanted to ask you natural insect control Dot com. Do you carry, I know, we know that you carry um, codling moth lures. Do you also carry apple maggot lures? We do carry apple maggot lures. We carry one similar to that. That's like a clear liquid. It, ours is in a little vial. We also carry the yellow disc ones, which is an ammonia one. That's used for a couple of different 
pests in the orchard, not only apple maggot, but also cherry maggot and walnut rust, uh, walnut maggot fly. Both of those mm. will be attracted to those ones. So we have two different ones that we have. Is there a lure for plum curculio? Oh, that's such an awesome question. In the U.S., in New York State, uh, one of the universities there has developed a really great lure for plum curculio. And for years, we have tried to be able to offer it to our customers. And it seems like every time we contact them, they sell out for the season so quickly that there's never any that's left over for the rest of the, I guess, the rest of uh, North America to use. They seem to sell it really quickly. So the formulation is out there. It can be made. It's now whether it's a pest that's strong enough to have a market share that another company will that makes lures will pick it up and actually manufacture it. And if it was Plum Curculio and guys on the line, you remember what the, the sign of Plum Curculio is that crescent moon, um, the, the crescent moon indentation that you'll find on the fruit. Um, would it be on a white trap? Would it be on a red ball? Would it be on a yellow trap? What would you attach that plum curculio lure to? It might actually go in something totally different. It might go in like a funnel trap. Uh, there's a Lindengren trap that's used for a lot of beetle capture, and it may have to go into something that is very unique just for beetles. Great. Okay. Good to know. Well, I look forward to talking to you guys in the fall to find out exactly what you're carrying so I can help to promote them next year so that my students will be able to find everything that we need. It's hard to get traps. So especially if you're not a huge grower with, you know, 10,000 trees. Okay. Traps and lures, that is. Quiz for you guys. I want you guys chatting. Got to make sure everybody's still alert. Uh, please tell me what is this and if you don't know I want you to throw in a guess it can even put you can put in a joke if you want but I want to know what is this little critter um, in the meantime let me see if there's any other chat happening nope Anthony was our last chatter here and Susan got it now can see everybody's comments as well so if anybody knows, how would you describe this, this larva that we're looking at without identifying it? What are we looking at? I see these white sort of dots. What is that? Without Do identifying. you want me to say what it is? No, not yet. Let's give them a chance. I want to see what they're going to guess. Guys, I'm not going to tell you until a few of you give us a guess. So tell me as you're looking at it, what are you seeing? So I'm definitely looking at the coloration of it. I'm definitely looking at the way um, hairs are on that particular pet, uh, particular caterpillar. Um, I'm looking at those two things mostly. Okay, and at the lower part, there those two things sticking down. What are we seeing at the lower part of the leaf and of the creature? I think that those are just some kind of like hair structure that they have uh, both at the back of it and at the front of that uh, that caterpillar. Okay, and the four red, the four white dots, what do you think that is? Is that just a coloration or is that a body part? You're totally or... right. No, you're coloration. totally right, that is just coloration. Wow, interesting. Okay, we got some guesses. Susan, large, sta large stage of a moth. Susan says again, larva. Anthony says some sort of butterfly or moth caterpillar. Well, thanks to Susan and Anthony, we can continue on because we have some guesses. And let's find out what is it. That is a tussock moth. That is one of the most beautiful caterpillars um, ever seen. The moth itself is not that showy and fun, but that is one of the most beautiful caterpillars to see in your backyard. Again, it does feed on a lot of plants, but it is a beautiful guy while he's feeding. Huh, interesting. It's just very unique looking. Um, let's see, I have another picture of him. Let's go, or her, and let's go look at the next one. Yeah, so this was Randall submitted this picture. I'm going to, so Randall says here, here is a photo of a pest I first noticed a week ago that was destroying the growth on my new graphs, causing a number of them to fail. I since have noticed a lot of them on a young three-year-old Honeycrisp tree. A mature apple tree, unknown variety nearby, has a few. Uh, I can't read the end of it because they are, for whatever reason, our video is on top. So it doesn't look like it's a problem, but I'm going to go to the next slide. I checked as soon as you identified it for me, I checked the omafra site under 
I think Apple pests. And it talked about it in our Omafra site. It said the a bunch of information about them, but it also said it's not actually a major Apple pest. It's really minor. Um, so this here is some information that I got about it. Uh, the outbreak can last two to four years. Um, their populations are suppressed by viruses, parasitoids, natural predators, and diseases. So that's how control they can be controlled. Natural predators, again, are key. Birds, perhaps, maybe. Um, they are really? good. Yes, okay. And there are rare pests in apple orchards, but when present in high numbers can cause considerable damage. So here where controls are necessary, early application of a biological control like BT would work. So anyways, that's back to show you how, you know, you guys are going to get some identification, then you go back to your IPM resource to get more information. So let's see if we've got more stuff left. Oh, yes, we got a few comments and questions about nibbled leaves. Um, I'm going to ask you guys to chat, but we'll probably Stacy and I will talk through this. Stacy, what what do you do when you see things like this? Does it is it um, helpful? Do you get enough information? I find that sometimes just the damage is not enough uh, for me to do a proper identification of what pests it might be. Um, lots of insects do really similar damage, so those leaves in particular could be something like Japanese beetles is eating it. We potentially could have even. Uh, May June bug beetles eating it. Um, it is difficult with just having the damage alone. And most times I do need to have some kind of pest that you've seen um, or potentially even the species of plant that it's on. Sometimes mm -hmm. that's helped because some pests are really distinct with or really specific to the, the plants that they feed on. Okay, well, let's look. We have another picture here. This is from Lois. She writes, I've attached three photos of the leaves of my apple tree. These trees were planted last spring. This is their second summer where they are not yet bearing fruit, but I expect by next year we should be getting our first apples. There's obviously some pest damage to the leaves, but I can't find the insect responsible as it doesn't seem to be visible on the leaves. Any help identifying what's going on is appreciated. So Stacy, I'm guessing this is similar. We're seeing holes in the leaves, uh, bites on the outside margins. Um, again, it's going to be hard for you to put your finger right on what it could be. It, it, unfortunately, yes. I have one other idea that may be helpful. Sometimes pests are just nocturnal. So going out during the day and looking at the plant to see if you see anything, but also going out uh, at dusk or just when it's starting to get dark and taking a look to see what might be on the plant then. You might catch one of the insects sort of in the act if they are one of those nocturnal feeders. Oh, that's a fantastic idea. That is That helps. And it's, it's a, you know, if everybody's going out, you're checking your trees and you never find them, well, nighttime, evening is a good idea. This is from Ram. Ram, I know you're on the line today. So Ram sent this in. This is an interesting one. He writes, this leaf looks eaten or like it was burnt. I did not see insects, so I was not able to take a picture of the insects. It might be something else. And I don't know if you guys can see this, but the way that the margins of the leaves, the outsides of the leaves, have been nibbled at or something, there's sort of necrosis, there's dead tissue around these little areas. Um, so he was wondering, could it even be a disease? Well, again, what, what are your thoughts on this? It, it, without seeing again an insect on it, really difficult to tell. I wonder if maybe some of the damage was done really early and this is sort of the result of the leaf as it it's coming out. This is sort of what is happening. Early damage things that cause that curling or sort of cupping of the leaves, maybe something that has a beak, so something like aphids. I'm just kind of throwing some stuff out there as ideas. Cool. Okay, Ram, you're doing amazing. Keep looking. Keep inspecting. Try that um, twilight thing, you know, early evening. Go have a look. Um, and just see if it if this is just one area of your tree, like in my espalier apple tree in my backyard, I've got a number of them. There's just one tree that's been hit in one mm -hmm. corner and it happened and it's not spreading. There's not more of it, so I'm not too worried. So have a look at the bigger con con context for that. Okay, love this. This is Susan again, Susan from Nova Scotia. So she sent this picture and I love it. She's testing out her new traps. 
Um, there is the apple, the um, red spherical ball, and here is her, uh, I guess it's a diamond trap. So again, Stacy, looking at her diamond trap, what are you seeing? I'm definitely thinking that there is some codling moths in there. Difficult to see, but down towards the bottom on the left-hand side, I'm looking at that. And the apple maggot one, I'm really sorry. I couldn't zoom in enough, but potentially that is one in the center of that apple maggot ball. Okay. Okay, so let me, I'm turning. Okay, potentially that's one in the center of the ball. Okay, great. So next picture, we're coming towards the end, I think. But we've got a couple more to go. So this is her sticky card. We discussed them earlier. So it's about taking the quadrants, looking at each quadrant. Does anything at all stick out uh, for you, Stacey, in this? Anything easy to identify and quick? There's a lot I of little, little bugs in there. There is a ton of little bugs in there and I would love to be able to zoom in and take a look at what's in those little quadrants just to see what it is. I, I can't identify anything unfortunately really well from the photo, but I'd love to be able to take a closer look at what's going on in those cards. At the actual trap. And so it's, thank you for explaining that it is really hard without having the trap in hand. But guys, we need our uh, magnifying glass to look at this stuff, seeing, you know, we just keep looking and see what we find. Okay, so Susan also, uh, she has lots of dimpled fruit on her trees. Um, she, there's frost, there's insect poop on some of the apples. She thinks it's apple maggot. In this picture, there is a fast moving spider. Is it helping her out? Spiders are beneficial. So uh, what are your thoughts, Stacy? Spiders, fantastic. They are do a ton of pest control for free in your orchard. So awesome to have a spider in there. Um, try not to disturb them, let them do their business, and you're probably getting a lot of pest control for free. That's great. And again, looking at, you've got your dimpled apples, you've got little, you know, sort of a bit misshapen. Could the, Now, the frost looks kind of big, but could this possibly be apple maggot as well? We've got lots of apple maggot going on. Yeah, it makes me think that it, it is. Okay, so that's what I'm thinking too. Let's go on. This is great. Susan writes, she's putting on her orchard socks. Um, so we encourage people to use them. They can really be great. Oh. oh my gosh, I love using these to prevent coddling moth because it can be so effective. But I just think it's an adorable picture. And Susan, she says, she's putting on socks. There's only 135 more to go. And I think it's funny because there's 140 in a package of socks. So she, at this point, she had done five socks. The other thing I want to comment on, and somebody in my uh, community orchard did this, and I thought, oh, that's going to be interesting. It looks like Susan put two baby apples in one sock. So both of those apples are going to grow. And uh, so I'm thinking... I hope it'll expand enough. I think so. But what a great experiment. Does it work? You know, you're going to have two apples in that cluster. I don't know. Maybe she put three in there. I don't think so. I think it's just two. I thought that was funny. Okay. So, and this is also from Susan. She says, I believe this is leaf roller activity, but an earwig was also in this rolled leaf. What do you think, Stacy? Definitely looks like a uh, leaf roller activity. Doesn't surprise me if there's earwig in there. Earwigs are actually really predatorial. So it might have been in there feeding on your leaf roller. Wow, I had no idea. That's interesting. Can, if, if do you always, if you see an earwig in your tree, is it always considered beneficial or could it be damaging the tree as well? They're omnivorous, so they're gonna feed on pests and they're gonna feed on plants. They okay. kind of go both ways, but having it in sort of a damaged area, more than likely it's going to be feeding on that pest. They're not necessarily as bad as most people think they are. They actually do have some benefits to them. Okay, good to know. That's great to know. Okay, so <laughs> Susan is saying, I think about the orchard socks, it takes a bit of time. It gets faster as you go along putting on the socks, but you know what? You get your friends to do it. You get You have a little gathering, you get your kids to do it. Um, anyway, so that's great. Back to the slideshow. Is there anything left? That's it, guys. It is, uh, this has been 50 minutes, five zero, 
And uh, we've actually only got five minutes left in the webinar because it, you know, oh no, we don't. We have more than five minutes. We got more time. So does anybody have any more questions for Stacy? For Stacy. So Susan says, I have questions about coddling moths and apple maggot. She says, my diamond trap has a coddling moth lure. Should I also be using a chemical treatment? I think what Susan is asking, I think what Susan is asking, should she be spraying her trees at the same time? If you can clarify, Susan. But what's your thought, Stacey, on that? If you're thinking of uh, doing any kind of treatment, I was wondering if maybe something uh, like a, a kale and clay, like a surround product that actually disguises the apples. So we're starting to see the pest in the trap and we want to disguise those apples so the pest can't find it. But I think that may be a good time to be thinking about doing something like that. So the clay basically covers the apples, it disguises them so the pests don't know that they're there. Now, if Susan's going to spray her tree with kale and clay or surround, should she take off the trap, walk away with it to make sure it doesn't get covered with kale and clay, and then put it back? Absolutely. Absolutely, Absolutely yeah, because that clay goes everywhere. <laughs> okay, Susan has another amazing question. She says, do the little dimples in my little apples mean those apples are totally damaged? Um, what do you think? Should she just pluck them I off? throw them away? I would pull them off, cut them open. I think she's going to find that there is going to be damage in there. Yeah. Yeah. And my concern always, I'm kind of brutal. I'm a bit of an extremist. And when I see damaged fruit, I take it right off, put it in a bag, get it out of the orchard because I don't want the stuff coming back year after year. So we've had a really hard year with apple maggot this year. I put up my trap too late. Bad, bad girl. So busy season. But uh, so yeah, I like to get the damaged fruit right off. And I my logic is, I am getting wiser and more experienced every year. It's all about my learning. So next year, I'll do better. I'll put the trap up earlier. I will have more considerations and things to do. Last words, would you like to say anything about naturalinsectcontrol.com? And when should people be ordering their traps? You know, what do you guys have to offer. Tell us anything we need to know if we're going to be getting traps from you for next year. For next year, think about ordering your traps in March. Um, it's a good time to really start things off strong because you want to have those traps ready and available for when your flowers, when your trees come into flower because usually at petal fall is the time you want to think about putting out your apple maggot traps, your codling moth traps. Really important to think about early in the season before things really get started. So you have them on hand and ready to go. Um, we're always happy if you have a unique pest or you have uh, want us to identify something, we're always happy to help with identifications, find a lure for you, find a trap for you. Um, there's lots of different uh, manufacturers out there and we're really lucky that we're able to work with all of them to be able to find specific things for certain pests. Fantastic. Well, Stacey, thank you so much. It's been awesome. I've had so much fun working with you. And thank you for giving us your time and sharing your knowledge with us. It's been super fun. Yeah, thank you, Susan. You're fantastic. And all of your students have been awesome. Thank you so much for this opportunity. It was really great. That's fantastic. Okay, great. Thanks, everybody. We are going to say goodbye for now. I will stop the recording in about eight seconds because it takes a little delay. And then uh, Stacy, you and I will be in touch and everybody can stay in touch with me. Okay, take care, guys. Bye.